welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and it's time for another monthly reading wrap up. In the month of July, I read a total of 10 books. Like I did last month, I will be going through the books I read by category of publication basically. So first I'll talk about the graphic publications I read, then move on to the non-fiction before wrapping up with the fiction. So first I read Culotté Volume 2 by Penelope Bajou. I don't have the copy with me because I borrowed it from the library and have since taken it back in. So recall, if you will, uh, in the month of June I read Volume 1, or was it perhaps at the very end of the month of May? I can't remember exactly. It was still very good. It was still a collection of biographical vignettes about different kinds of women who have defied the gender stereotype of their time or place and accomplished interesting and or even extraordinary things. One of the women featured in volume two was, for example, Temple Grandin, who is a woman on the autism spectrum who pioneered more humane ways of handling cattle within, you know, cattle farming and things like that. That one was probably my favorite of that volume, actually, but there were other very interesting women featured in that volume. As I mentioned last month, you can actually purchase both of these volumes in a single book in English. That's how it's been translated. It's called Brazen Women and or Girls Who Didn't Follow, or I mean, you know, the gender rules of their time period or their place. And what I'll probably do is actually purchase my very own copy of these graphic books, but in English, because that way, you know, it'll be cheaper and simpler and I'll have both volumes in one. But I would definitely recommend them if you enjoyed something like Women in Art and Women in Science by Rachel Ignatowski, if you're interested by just fascinating female individuals throughout history and things like that. Then I read L'Age d'Or, Volume 2, by Cyril Pedroza and Roxane something, I cannot remember the name of the artist off the top of my head apologies for that. Once again, last month I'd read volume one and had mixed feelings about it, basically. I thought the art style was very striking, a very unique, quite beautiful, but also borderline overstimulating visually, to be quite honest. Same goes for volume two, basically. The art style was still beautiful. I actually thought it was a bit toned down with regards to the overstimulation. However, I didn't like it at all. The thing is, I thought there was a huge chunk of the story missing. I couldn't tell how much time was supposed to have elapsed between volume one and volume two. A lot of things happen in volume two, but it feels so disconnected from volume one that I didn't really care about anything that was happening, about any of the characters. I don't think there's any character work to speak of, really. There aren't any real themes to speak of either. It was just almost a complete non-entity. There was nothing there. It was so empty and thus extremely disappointing. I just didn't get the point of the second volume, and thus I didn't get the point of the overarching story these graphic novels were going for. So yeah, I mean, beyond the fact that it's a heroic medieval quest type story with a female protagonist, and even that base premise is significantly overstated, in my opinion. I think it has been translated into English, but I would not recommend them. I mean, don't waste your time with them. Like, I just didn't get the point, so yeah, but at least I didn't have to pay for them because I borrowed them from my local library, so that's a plus in my book. And then I read this, Radium Girls by the artist author C. I had actually read a couple of things by this female creator a while back. They were like little vignettes about people's sex lives, and those little books were very cute. I actually showed them in my very recent bookshelf tour, if you want to check that out. So this I also borrowed from the library. I was intrigued because I do enjoy the artist's art style, and because of the story. So Radium Girls takes a look at the women who worked in factories that produced watch dials that were painted with radium. Or, I mean, the numbers on the watch dials were painted with radium so it would glow in the dark. Now, I would have enjoyed a bit more information concerning this because I was really shocked. I was like, well, Marie Curie worked with radium and she died from radiation poisoning, so wasn't it no? 
known or understood that radium was freaking dangerous and potentially highly toxic to people who came into contact with them. Apparently in the 1920s, radium was put into skin creams to appear youthful. And so, like I said, watch dials were painted with radium so it would be glow in the dark and things like that. And so these women would paint the dials but then smooth the paintbrushes with their lips. So they were basically ingesting very small quantities of radium over time. And I mean, it's not really a spoiler, this is based on historical fact. These women died in horrible agony and suffering because they were dying from radiation poisoning. And so it takes a look at this group of female friends working in one of these factories, these watch factories, and what happens to them and the slow realization that they're falling ill and that the illness was caused by them working at that factory and being into regular contact with radium. And some of these women even went so far as to sue the companies for which they had worked. And this apparently in the end, despite the fact that these women died and, you know, didn't get a lot of money out of their suits, it did lead to the creation of OSHA in the United States and, well, to the improvement of, you know, worker protection rules and things like that. Overall, it was an interesting graphic novel. It was quite moving because, I mean, these poor women, you just, my heart went out to them because it was just so sad and so tragic. But I guess overall, I would have actually enjoyed a bit more science in this graphic novel, a bit more examination of the radium, of how how this could actually happen to begin with, how it was sold to the public, that radium was somehow good to maintain youthful skin and things like that. It does center a lot on the friendships between this group of women, and I just didn't really feel any of it that much. I couldn't really relate. Well, for one thing, to being part of a group of female friends, that's never really been my experience. But again, that's a me problem. A lot of people relate to this on a much more viscerally emotional level. I did feel a lot of emotion by reading this, but not because of like the core of female friends. It was like, take it and leave it for me, basically. But so, I mean, overall, I would still recommend this. I think I gave this a 7 out of 10, so it was definitely a worthwhile read. Then, this past month, I also read two books of nonfiction. First, I read Men Who Hate Women by Laura Bates. I'd previously read Everyday Sexism by this same author. This is basically an overview of the manosphere, which comprises incels, involuntary celibates, MGTOW, so men going their own way, men's rights activists, and what else? Oh yeah, pickup artists, and, you know, people generally associated with what is called the red pill. Now, I was already quite familiar with the subject matter from my shortish stint on Reddit of all places. So there's a lot of very discouraging and depressing stuff in there because, yeah, there are men out there who really, really hate women. I mean, they say they hate us, but at the same time, they want to have sex with us. You know, go figure that one out, but whatever. The one thing I did find really interesting is that it also talks about, well, the few terrorist attacks that have been committed by self-proclaimed cells. And it also talks about, well, the wider ramifications of like this extreme, originally online misogyny into wider society. And I mean, how societal misogyny feeds into these internet movements, and then how these internet movements contribute their own misogyny back into society, you know what I mean? That also means she makes a link with wider rape culture, with domestic violence specifically, even going so far as to call domestic violence a form of individualized terrorism. And she makes a very interesting case for recognizing these violent crimes against women as a form of terrorism. And some people might be a bit wary about that because like terrorism is supposed to be flashbangs and bombs and it's associated with Islamism and things like that. But then she says, well, no. From the minute you commit an act of violence in order to well, impose fear onto a certain part of the population, then that is, according to the definition, terrorism. Especially if it's aligned with an ideology, in this case, violent misogyny, violent patriarchy, whichever way you want to actually call it. And so that made quite a bit of sense to me, actually. You can have Islamist terrorism, you can have white nationalist terrorism, and in fact, there are a lot of links between white nationalists and misogynists from the manosphere. Like, there's a lot of overlap between the alt-right and the manosphere as well. So she makes all these connections, and these connections made a lot of sense to me, but once again, that's because I was already pretty familiar with the subject matter. It's quite similar to 
some Francophone feminists fighting to get intimate partner violence and more specifically intimate partner murders recognized as feminicide and thus to be recognized as a type of hate crime. Once again, a very worthwhile read, a very depressing read. Though, I will say this, she's actually quite optimistic throughout the book. She places a lot of importance on education and going into schools and talking to young people, children, young teenagers, and trying well to prevent a lot of this stuff from escalating any further, trying to well, prevent boys from ending up on these online circles, or I mean between groups of boys and just letting sexism and misogyny fester. And I think she's quite hopeful in that regard. I'm not sure I always share her optimism, but it was refreshing to see that she's absolutely not bashing all men. This is not a book about hating men, as I saw some commenters say on Goodreads, like, please, can we start with that? She's actually trying trying to say there's a way to work together to make things better for everyone. I mean, for women, primarily, but ultimately for everyone. And then this week, I read Inferior by Angela Saini. She's a journalist with a background in science. So this is a book that dates back to, what, 2017 or 18, I think. It's basically like an overview of different studies around gender and debunking, like, this idea that men and women are fundamentally different creatures, almost, like, from different planets. But it doesn't just look at, like, neurological studies and like neurosexism. It also takes a look at studies being done in anthropology, sociology, the study of sexuality. So it's a fairly wide approach. She does have a chapter on this idea of like fundamentally different brains between men and women. There's a chapter concerned with female sexuality and this idea that females naturally aren't that interested in sex and kind of debunking that. There's a chapter about menopause and why it might have evolved and ultimately trying to show that just because a woman gets menopause and becomes older doesn't mean she's worthless or has no place in society and lots of different things like that it looks at studies on primates studies done on contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, etc, etc. This means that it doesn't really go that deeply into any one sub-subject, but it does give you a good overview of this general topic of using science to understand that men and women aren't that fundamentally different, and also examining the way science is prone to bias, because science is done by human beings, and human beings are biased creatures, and historically speaking, science has mostly been done by straight men. And so she also shows how the fact that more women are going into science and bringing their lived experiences into it, their female-informed perceptions actually helps to get to a more accurate version of the truth, I guess. But she's also, like, open to interviewing scientists who have very traditional points of views. I say there are very fundamental differences between men and women. So she's not going into this project trying to ignore contradicting evidence. Overwhelmingly, this book is pro the idea that there aren't any fundamental differences between men and women, but she also acknowledges that there are limitations to what we can actually know and learn from different fields. One little thing that I found slightly disappointing, especially in the chapter regarding sexuality, but that's not so much a problem with the author's approach. It's just something that I found frustrating coming from a lot of the scientists she was interviewing. It's like none of these scientists scientists are really taking into account the fact that sex is highly social in human beings. Like, that's one of the only defining characteristics, as I understand it, of Homo sapiens, is that sex has a very strong social aspect and bonding aspect in our species, and yet all these evolutionary biologists, anthropologists, are still going off of a primarily reproductive perception of sex, even for humans. And I'm like, but there's this huge chunk of our specificity as a species that you're just ignoring in your studies. Now, perhaps that's because it introduces too many confounding variables, and when you want to have a clean model of something, you want to limit confounding variables, but the fact is that then doesn't actually reflect reality. Anyway, that's a debate for another day in any case. But so yeah, I would definitely recommend this, but keep in mind that it doesn't go that much in depth in any one area. It's a good introduction, I guess, to this general topic. 
then on to the fiction I read this past month. First, I read Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergei Diachenko. This is a novel translated from the Russian, and I had heard of this novel through another booktuber's channel and was intrigued by the premise. The premise is that you have a young woman on vacation with her mother at the seaside, and she's approached by a strange man who wants to set her a few strange tasks. And if she completes the tasks, she vomits up golden coins, and eventually these golden coins give her access to a very strange school called the Institute of Special Technologies. And things are very weird there, because she has a class where the textbooks are basically incomprehensible, and students have to memorize very strange exercises that don't make any sense until after a while when something clicks in their brain and suddenly it does make sense and so on and so on. I won't go any further than that because I don't want to spoil this if you're interested in it. This is the third most disappointing thing I read this year after semiosis and trust exercise. I thought it was, I mean I don't want to overuse the word pretentious because I have no idea what the intent of the authors was, so maybe it's not so much a question that it was pretentious, I just thought it was trying to do things and it failed to do those things. I think it was trying to be quite philosophical and metaphysical, but I didn't think it was that deep. This is apparently sold as dark academia and like Harry Potter meets Kafka and I'm like, you need to to be aware of this. This has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with something like Harry Potter or even A Wizard of Earthsea. Apparently some people compare this to The Magicians by Lev Grossman. I mean, yeah, there's a bit of a dark academia vibe because the teachers are sadistic sociopaths and there are elements of sexual coercion in there and a character is strongly encouraged to lose her virginity and it's just weird. And like, if the students... See, this is the thing. Thing, the students don't really have a choice but to go to this institute because if they don't, bad things are going to happen to their families. A family member might have an accident, a baby might die, things of that general idea, some like psychological torture, check. Borderline physical torture, check. Weird attitudes towards sex, check. So yeah, it's very dark, academia, I guess. I also had a kind of an issue with the writing. I don't know if it's well translated. I do not speak Russian, so I have no idea. Idea, but it felt like a translation. Does that make sense? I cannot explain this rationally. I just felt like there was something a bit off about the writing. Like it was supposed to be translated a certain way and it didn't quite make it. So make of that what you will. There's next to no character development really. There's only one main point of view, which is that of the main female character, Sasha. I would have enjoyed actually a couple more points of view from characters which seem somewhat more interesting than Sasha really. And then okay, I mean, without spoiling anything, this basically plays around again with the idea that basically language creates reality, and so there isn't actually reality before language, and so with language you can manipulate reality. There is magic of a kind, there isn't really a magic system as such, or maybe perhaps towards the end, and it has to do with language, but then it gets ridiculous, in my opinion. I will give points for the atmosphere created throughout the novel. It did nail the creepy, uncomfortable atmosphere of a dangerous and abusive environment. Yes, that was very well done, but I didn't care about the main character, I didn't care about the other characters. It's not so much that like I didn't understand what was going on, I kind of got the point towards the end, or I mean a bit before the end, and once I got the point, I just didn't care because it's a point that relies on certain philosophical assumptions that I just don't personally agree with, so it's not to my personal preference, and as such, I just didn't give a crap. And the end is very strange, I guess you could interpret it in different ways, but I was just done. <laughs> I was just done. I wanted it to be over, and so yeah, massive disappointment. And then I read the new Crobazon trilogy by China Nieville, which comprises Perdido Street Station, The Scar, and Iron Council. I did a full-length series review for this trilogy, if you're interested, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Suffice it to say that I really enjoyed this trilogy. It's not my favourite thing by Nieville. It hasn't outstripped Embassy Town or even Kraken quite. Though I guess as a whole, 
Like I said in my review, as a whole, this series actually kind of transcends the sum of its parts. So as a whole, it perhaps rivals Kraken somewhat. Extremely creative with the world building, fairly rich with the theming. Overall, good enough, I guess, with the character work and the writing. What's well, China Mievel's writing? I love that kind of writing. I thought it was delicious. Some people will find it pretentious or too pedantic or what have you. But I would personally recommend this trilogy if you like weird fiction more specifically weird urban fantasy. If you really like Mievel, and if you haven't already read these, then obviously you should read these. And finally, again this past week, I read The Fall of Gondolin by, well, J.R.R. Tolkien, but edited by his son Christopher Tolkien. And, you know, you can basically apply what I said about Baron Luthien to this, though this featured less epic poetry. I did enjoy the epic poetry in Baron Luthien, but I guess here I enjoyed the straightforward narratives, prose narratives, a tad more. So perhaps I'll give like an extra half point to The Fall of Gondolin. So once again, this book presents the different versions of The Fall of Gondolin chronologically. So it shows you how Tolkien came up and revised this story, one of the great tales of the Elder Days. And well, it's talking. I liked it. Again, it didn't really tread new ground. Though actually you do get some extra details, I guess, because some earlier versions of The Fall of Gondolin provide more detailed descriptions of Gondolin itself and tourist time in Gondolin and things like that. So yeah, I mean, you're gonna read this if you're a talking nerd. I mean, a talking verse nerd. As I am, mostly. And in any case, I expect now to have my talking nerd credentials validated. <laughs> I'm joking, but you know. And of course, wonderful illustration by Alan Lee. That's also one of the reasons I wanted to read this and Baron Luthien and add it to my collection of illustrated talking books. So yeah, read this if you're really into the Legendarium. If you want to have a glimpse into Tolkien's creative process and things of that general order really. So I would recommend this but like to a very specific set of people. Now I have read all of the books dedicated to those great tales of the Elder Days. The only thing missing <laughs> is the new edition of Unfinished Tales, which will also be illustrated by Alan Lee. But I mean, I have already read that book. And now I'm done, basically. I will not be reading the History of Middle-earth books because that's for the, like, hardcore talking nerds, and I'm not quite at that level. So that concludes this month's wrap-up. In the month of August, I'll be reading, once again, a mix of things, a bit of science fiction, a couple of fancy masterworks as well, and a bit of non-fiction. And I won't get into more detail than that because I plan for a change on doing a little book haul video in a couple of days and well some of the books I will be showing in that video are books I'm going to be reading in August. In the meantime I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening or whichever time of day you prefer. Take good care of yourselves and I shall see you well like I said fairly soon in the next video. Bye! -bye.